Thank you very much. And it looks like it's going to be a very nice conference uh, here as well. So I'm looking forward to that. So good afternoon. Um, and thank you for the invitation to talk about the uh, human-centered intelligent uh, vehicles. And I was thinking what would be the subject of a good um, a presentation that we would be worthwhile sharing uh, with you. Well, um, what I thought was, well, on the one hand you have the human factors, and on the other hand you have the, the technology, and they need to go hand in hand. So do we have a happy marriage between psychology and technology, um, and uh, how can we uh, uh, get this, uh, this happy marriage? Um, I will be reviewing some, uh, uh, some work of projects that we have uh, uh, done recently and um, give a, uh, a, um, a, a short glimpse in the future of projects that we are about uh, to, uh, to do. So we just started working on them and that will be uh, uh, interesting for uh, later on. Um, so, a, as a short introduction, um, who knows this picture? Oh, good. It's, uh, it's a classic one, and I, I think it's still, uh, still actual. It's uh, the, uh, the roadmap for advanced driver assistance systems that was made in the ADASA project in, uh, in Europe. And it gives all different, um, different functionalities of driver assistance systems and also the research aspects to be uh, Included and at the uh, uh, left column you see the uh, expected safety uh, safety enhancements. Um, more uh, simply, what we have now on uh, driver assistance systems is uh, you start with informing drivers. Um, when you are able to do that, you can uh, start to support actively driving tasks. Um, and, um, well, informing is, for instance, by a navigation system, which could give all kinds of, uh, of, of warnings as well. An active system that will support you is adaptive cruise control, also presented here. And um, control that is um, um, a full control is, for instance, um, you see here the, uh, the experiments on full automation of, uh, of driving that were conducted. Um, already some 10 years ago in the Netherlands by uh, um, the, the PATH group. So why do we want intelligent vehicles? Well, um, instead of answering the question, uh, um, I usually show this, uh, this picture and everybody uh, understands why, we, uh, uh, why intelligent vehicles uh, um, are needed. So um, there are some things that uh, humans can do uh, quite well and other things that uh, um, is better that uh, we have the technology. And we have high expectations on intelligent vehicles. Uh, one is to reduce um, uh, congestion, to reduce accidents, emissions, but also um, as a basis for a, a new business. And um, uh, the driver is the key to... Um, the introduction of intelligent uh, uh, vehicles. We can make new technology as much as, uh, as we like, but if the driver doesn't, doesn't buy it, doesn't like it, doesn't use it, um, it will uh, not work. So user acceptance is uh, very important, and I've mentioned some of the issues that are related to that, usefulness, accessibility, availability, learnability is, uh, is important. And the second issue is uh, behavioral adaptations. Um, new systems uh, lead to new behavior. So, um, and what we um, hope that um, if, if we develop a system, we have some kind of, of new um, behavior of the, the, the combined vehicle uh, and driver combination in mind, but we never know how it's going to uh, turn out. So, because the driver will also uh, always adapt to the uh, to the new situation. Um, so that's a fact, and um, um, we need to study uh, to which extent uh, this is the case, and to which extent the result indeed will lead to better uh, safety and uh, and um, acceptance. So this is. Um, 
a picture of one of uh, the projects that it has now uh, been uh, been completed and um, what effect um, what you need to do is if you want to uh, design intelligent vehicles and develop intelligent vehicles integrating the human factor should be done right from the start so you need to write at the start, start using the human factor. So I'll get applause from Mohan at the front. So, um, and the, uh, the project uh, that we did was um, um, we designed a design development, a uh, design environment for a lane change assistance. So, in a driving simulator uh, setting, a driver was able to uh, configure his own uh, lane change assistance. Um, in terms of what kind of sensors do I want, which kind of alarm levels do I want, which kind of interface to the drivers do I, uh, um, do I want. Um, and this led to an, uh, uh, a virtual environment in which we can um, um, let the driver design his own, uh, his own systems. And in fact, the designer of the system takes one step back. He does not design the system, but he designs the alternatives that the driver can choose from. And in the next project, um, we are um, applying this principle to uh, the, the issue of human vehicle cooperation, because in the end, you should not have the human and the vehicle and the, and the system. Um, they should uh, cooperate in, in some way. So the vehicle uh, should only assist the driver when it's needed and uh, uh, when the driver uh, actually would like it. Um, so, um, I'm going to um, review uh, two cases in, uh, in a bit more detail that we, uh, that we did. And the first case actually shows a good uh, example of the marriage between technology and the, uh, and the human factors. It was um, a project that we started with a, uh, with a survey in which we asked people, what kind of support would you actually like to have from your car? So we did not present them with any kinds of driver support system at all. We just asked them, what kind of support would you, uh, would you like? And um, the general answer was that people like to have warnings about um, uh, dangerous situations. Dangerous situations at intersections, at rural roads, at motorways, uh, when changing lane. Um, and when you ask people, would you like the car to, uh, to take over control? Um, their uh, initial response usually is no, I, I don't like my car to take over control. But there are a few exceptions. Um, one of the exceptions is um, um, if, a, if an accident can no longer be avoided, um, then active control is accepted. We see now, um, for instance, in uh, new models by Volvo, that there is a system that will intervene, it will actively brake when an accident is unavoidable. And of course, there's no time to ask a driver um, um, whether the system should, should make an emergency uh, maneuver. Another um, situation in which active support is accepted by the driver um, is in congestion, because people do not like to drive in congestion. And this was the uh, motivation to select a, uh, a, a design a system as a congestion assistant. It detects the downstream uh, congestion. It gives a visual and auditive warning at about five kilometers before the congestion. Um, then at a certain uh, distance from the tail of the congestion, it has an active gas pedal to smoothly slow down. And um, when uh, you actually hit the congestion, it will take over the longitudinal driving task. Um, we investigated the system in a, in a driving simulator, and this is what we found um, for the effects on, uh, on time headway. Um, with the system, there was a very uh, short headway, and uh, or without the system, there was a very uh, uh, long headway, which led to uh, low densities in congestion, and with the system, the headways were much uh, shorter, meaning that um, the, the system um, follow the other vehicles much closer. So drivers tend to uh, leave large gaps in case of, uh, of congestion, which reduces the capacity uh, in, in congestion. 
So the system helps in, in uh, uh, following more closely. Um, we studied the acceptance of these systems uh, using the uh, uh, Van der Laan scale, which is a structured questionnaire uh, which uh, measures usefulness uh, by a number of attributes and also the satisfaction, so it has a kind of objective and subjective um, component. Um, the warning uh, function was uh, uh, quite high uh, appreciated. Um, the active pedal was um, um, considered quite useful, but uh, slightly, uh, slightly irritating, I think, um, that's an issue that can be improved. I think that was um, uh, caused by the specific design. Three more minutes. Okay, go to speed up. Um, the stop and go um, was uh, very highly uh, appreciated. And uh, these are the figures after the experiment and before the experiments. The, um, um, the figures were a bit uh, lower. So the experiments increased the acceptance of the system. And next, we did uh, traffic simulation studies using the very uh, same system. This is a picture of the uh, speed. Um, and uh, this is about 10% uh, of the vehicles is equipped with the congestion assistant. Um, in red, you see the reference uh, situation. You see congestion occurring with uh, low speeds. And especially um, the, uh, the, the top um, lines, they reflect the, uh, the active stop and go system uh, with a 1.0 and 0.8 second uh, headway and this um, decreased the uh, uh, travel time in congestion by 30%. So we have a system that is acceptable uh, to the people, they appreciate it and it has good impacts on traffic. Um, second case is about the uh, human-centered design of ITS for Urban, urban environment, so motorways is a, a relatively simple environment, but when you come to urban environments, it's a, a complex environment, and ITS may be of help. In the project, we wanted to design an ITS uh, system, but in the end, we found that we only had time to really understand the basic behavior. We especially looked at the uh, relation between mental workload and the drive response to cr safety critical situation. So in the driving simulator, we had 10 identical intersection that people uh, needed to drive and uh, before one of the sections there was a sudden braking by the predecessor. And we gave the uh, subjects an uh, additional uh, task, uh, uh, increasing their mental workload, an easy uh, computational task, so just um, adding uh, figures or subtracting figures and a difficult one which had to do with uh, multiplication of, uh, of, of numbers. And we measured the workload by a peripheral detection task and heart rate measurement. Um, these are uh, the results, and um, I'm going to explain them. Um, what you see from left to right is the measurement of speeds at um, subsequent intersections. So at the left column, um, you see that um, um, uh, this is the part where the predecessor breaks. So you see that the, uh, um, uh, the dotted line are the experiments where the predecessor breaks and the continuous line is without uh, the braking. So you see a lower speed. And in the uh, figures after that, um, you see what happens in the next intersection. So the first, second and third intersection after that. So on the top line, there's no additional uh, task. So it's regular driving. And you see at the second intersection that still needs to recover from the uh, from the braking, and then it has a kind of similar approach to the intersection. Um, at the second intersection afterwards, it's uh, the driver um, is a bit more uh, conservative, and at the third intersection, the driver is uh, more or less restored to the original driving. Now, what's interesting, if you have the easy additional task, um, more or less the same happens, but um, the driver uh, at the third intersection is still um, uh, driving conservatively. So it's still taking uh, care uh, and um, we expect it has to do with additional workload, um, but the, the workload is in such a way that it is still able to make conscious decisions about his uh, driving style. Um, when there's a difficult additional task, um, 
you see that um, um, drivers have, have no, um, um, well, the mental workload is so high that they um, do no longer make a conscious decision about adapting their driving behavior. So they uh, quite fast, in a fast way, they stick to their normal driving behavior uh, again. So um, it's not only by increasing the mental workload, but also uh, the height of the mental workload is, uh, is very important. And uh, we found this in, uh, in two different driving simulator experiments. So implications are that drivers compensate by increasing headway after safety uh, critical situations. And what you see is that at the high mental workload, there is no compensation because um, the compensation requires um, active, uh, some, uh, an active attitude by the driver. And if the workload is too high, um, there's no room to uh, take this action. And we've been uh, figuring now what that means to, to ITS systems, and this is, this is open for discussion. Um, what it certainly means is that ITS systems need to avoid a high mental workload. I think that is, that is obvious. On the other hand, their ITS systems could be most needed at high mental workloads because the driver does not have the means to, uh, uh, to do that themselves. So, and this would also um, um, imply that you need to be able to identify high mental workloads. So, and I think the the presentation, the the, the last presentation, was very interesting. Uh, it, it gave several suggestions how to uh, to measure that. And I'd, adaptive ITS systems, which um, have very specific situations in which they um, are engaged, and also um, driver state uh, uh, monitoring, this may lead to uh, to good results. So, thank you. Thank you so much. I hope